All right, so we are also going to share uh, some of the results of our own longitudinal uh, ev evaluation of, of the uh, neurocognitive and behavioral outcomes of the year-long Aerosmith program here in uh, the Pacific Northwest. So we'll start with just a description of the Aerosmith Longitudinal Study, which I'm going to hand it over. Right. So, um, so we started the study here at UBC in 2014. We actually started collecting data. We had conversations about it for some time before then. And the design that we took was to look at students when they first came into the Aerosmith program and then follow them for the first year. So very similar to what Dr. Rose did in, in Carbondale. Um, we undertook a, a, an ambitious project to also um, include two control groups, um, a control group of kids who have a diagnosis of some kind of learning challenge, learning difficulty, um, but were not participating in Aerosmith schools. So they came from other programs here in Vancouver and the Lower Mainland. And then a, a second control group of just typically developing students, just normal development, because a lot changes in a year, you know, in the fourth grade, for example. Um, and so we just wanted to control for, in, in specifically in terms of our brain imaging studies, kind of those differences we might see across the year. So we collected um, data on kids. We did functional MRI imaging, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. And um, Rachel's group uh, did uh, neuropsychological assessments, which I will not speak to at all because I'll say everything wrong. So all of that will be here in just a second. We looked at kids, you know, uh, sometime in the first maybe six to weeks to two months of the school year, just depending on when we could get them into the scanner and what worked for them. And then again, at the end of the school year in, in May or June, depending on when they were heading off. So um, I mentioned we did neuroimaging, which I will speak to. There was psychoeducational testing, neuropsych, and then some behavioral rating scales as well. Uh, so our inclusion criteria, uh, because of the scanning, really, because of the MRI, was looking at a fairly broad range, but no children younger than the age of nine. Uh, it's just really, really hard to get kids, even nine is pushing it, um, but it's really hard to get kids to lay still enough to be in the MRI. So that was a big uh, issue with the lower bound and then out to the age of 17. And in our group, all of the kids are right-handed, um, not because I have anything specific against left-handed kids or left-handed people in general, um, but this allows us to do group analyses with our MRI data and your brains are highly specialized for your handedness, particularly um, in the cortex itself. And so if we mix up people with left and right um, handedness, then it, it uh, confuses where different things may be localized in the brain. So this was really just to enable um, a, a large amount of data processing. It is a limitation of this study. It's also a limitation of almost every other MRI study ever done. Um, it's something the field does need to confront, but all of our kids were right-handed. And then we didn't take kids who had head, head trauma or you know, contraindications to MRI, for example. Um, the big one there is having braces, which is a real problem in this age group. Um, we also you know, tried to exclude kids who had other diagnoses, such as Down syndromes or um, autism, for example. And so the data we'll show you tonight um, are coming from uh, 52 children, um, 22 girls, and 30 boys. They're just exactly, and this is just sampling, it worked out that they were the same age, an average age of uh, 12. Um, and here's our neuroimaging protocol. So we took four different types of scans here at UBC. Um, and I'll only really speak to one of them tonight. So the first one is we looked at just anatomy, called a T1 image. And um, what the importance of this scan is uh, we use it as kind of the backdrop for our functional imaging. So um, this would just be the, the image of the brain in terms of the, the high resolution anatomy, where things are localized. Um, you know, uh, this is something we use in other studies to look at lesions, things like that. We looked at resting state, functional MRI, which uh, Dr. Rose has already told you quite a bit about. Um, and we have data analyses underway right now in my group looking at the relationship between um, reading and reading comprehension and resting state imaging. Um, and that's being led by one of my fellows, Dr. Brian Greeley. So we should um, have some data to show and actually a paper to send out very soon on this, actually. Um, our third set of scans is we actually had kids performing the clocks task in the MRI. And we did functional imaging while they performed the clocks task. So we have functional MRI taken during that. Um, 
it's a little bit tricky when you try to do this because the kids were at really different levels when they did the clocks, especially beginning to the end of the school year. And as the clocks becomes more complicated, it's obviously involving many, many different types of brain areas. Um, and so that's something that we had to control for. Um, and it was interesting even to just see how much progress the kids made in the clocks from the beginning to the end of the year. So those are data I won't show tonight. Um, what I will show you tonight, though, are our data from brain structure. And so we look to see how much change or whether or not the baseline structure of the brain um, could be predictive of the response to the, um, a year um, of work in the Aerosmith program. So this is what it looked like. Um, we did a scan at baseline. We have the one-year scan, which would be scan three up here. And then we do have an intermediate scan on, on um, many of the kids, not exactly all of them. We also did a scan right around Christmas time, right around January, December, trying to understand if the most, um, if we saw different rates of change, for example. So more change in the beginning of the year or the end of the year. Um, and those are analyses that we haven't done um, yet. We've really focused more on this longitudinal beginning to end. Oh, let me let uh, Rachel speak to the, yeah, right there. So you're gonna see a lot of uh, familiar tests. We've used a lot of the same ones, Dr. Rose's group and ours. Uh, so psychoeducational testing, that's the testing that you might, several of your children may have um, gone through. This is the kind of testing that's done to identify learning disabilities in schools. Um, so um, the, we used one of the most broadly or widely used batteries, which is the Woodcock Johnson, and we used the cognitive abilities um, test. We use a third edition, um, which we've now, the, the fourth edition has been published, but in order to have continuity across our sample, we just use the three. Um, so we use the cognitive and the achievement, which I, I do teach the only graduate course in academic assessment at this university, so I can vouch for the measure of achievement there, Dr. Rose. <laughs> if you'd like to take my course, just let me know. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, he, he can teach me a lot. Um, so, uh, and, and down here, we just have the, the actual participants that completed all of our tests. These are just the Aerosmith participants. We had 28 total that we collected uh, psychoeducational uh, data on uh, with similar um, age range and time in the program. It's about one academic year, so about nine months. Um, uh, an, an IQ in the average range according to our testing. And then what I've done at the bottom is actually taken, you probably can't read that in the back, but I looked at their uh, baseline uh, achievement scores to determine whether they likely had uh, a learning disability in particular areas. And what we see is just, a, as you would expect, a, a large, in some cases, over half um, of the students who were Aerosmith uh, students with a likely learning disability in, say, math. So um, that would usually you would only see uh, three to five percent of the population having an LD, so higher proportion than you would expect, or than you expect in the typical population, but it makes sense within this population, right? Uh, then moving on from the uh, traditional psychoeducational battery, we also added in uh, tests that are more neuropsychological in nature, specifically tests of executive functioning. Um, which includes in the most commonly used model in inhibitory control or inhibition, uh, cognitive flexibility or shifting. Uh, and those are both measured by the NIH toolbox, the flanker task and the um, dimensional change card sort task. I can talk about those later if you have questions. And then we used a working memory battery that includes four tests so that we could make sure to measure both visual and auditory or verbal working memory. Uh, and also look at both memory span, which is also what you know as short-term memory, and working memory, which is more of the manipulation of information. We had four measures that measured each of those things. With the neuropsychological test battery, we've only had 17 so far that have completed that at both time points. And then finally, our behavioral rating scales. Uh, we also collected the BASC um, at pre and post. Uh, and this is a rating scale. Again, some of you may have completed these forms before. Um, so this is a broad measure of social, emotional, and behavioral functioning. And we um, do have some self-report scales, but we're just going to report on the parent scales for you tonight. 
Um, so parents completed these scales about their children in the Aerosmith program at, um, before and after a year in the program. And we have 22 of those to talk about. And we are also collecting behavioral ratings of executive functioning, but we, we're not quite ready to report that yet. We don't have quite the sample size yet. Okay. Yeah, I guess I need that. Um, so I just wanted to comment really quickly, um, not at all on the neuropsych or that, those assessments. So I'm a neuroimaging person like Dr. Rose. I'm happiest in the MRI scanner with nothing metal on me, which is kind of my normal place of being. And so we, um, I was fortunate enough to be introduced to Rachel after we were already a couple years into the project um, by Dr. Brad Hale, who I would consider to be a friend of this research. And so we, she was astute enough, and this being her area of expertise, it was just a godsend, frankly. And so you can see that she's added in uh, some nice assessments as we've gone along, and that's why we have some asymmetry in those numbers. And so um, it's really made the project much, much better, and we're really grateful for that. So I'll speak to the, the uh, neuroimaging results to date, um, at least as I was, I was with respect to the brain structure, and then hand it back to her. So we have um, kind of two, two things I'll show you tonight from our neuroimaging data. And the first one was looking at just some relationships between some MRI measures of, of a structure in the brain called myelin, which I'll explain in just a second, and looking at cognitive or academic ability. And then secondly, um, in my group in particular, we're very interested in this idea of what we call biomarkers. And so we're very interested in saying, is there a measure we could take that would tell us who's gonna be best for what type of therapy. And so that's what a biomarker does. If you, if you have your can breast cancer, for example, you'll have a genetic test and there'll be a biomarker that'll tell you what's the right um, chemotherapy for that cancer. So we were looking at something kind of similar. Is there a brain structure we could image that would say, oh, this kid's gonna just do fantastic in this intervention, or maybe if we got really good, you know, this kid, this kid needs clocks and that kid needs something else. You could really try to drill it down. And so the second objective here is really to start to explore our data to say, do we have any biomarkers in here to tell us who's really maybe best positioned to respond to this um, intervention? And so um, in the sample I'll show you here, it's a little asymmetrical. So we have 14 typically developing children and 37 of the kids who participated in the uh, one, one year of the Aerosmith program. And so in, in this measure, we're really interested in the structure that, that's called myelin. And so um, this is a, a feature in, in all of our brains. And what myelin is, is it is actually a, a fat that wraps our axons. So our, you have these brain cells in your brain, they're called neurons. They have long projections that allow signals to be conducted from place to place in the brain. So with any long wire, just as these wires up here in the ceiling, they have to be insulated or else the signal decays over time. It doesn't get where it needs to get, it might, or it might not get there at the right time. And so that's what myelin does. And so this is a, just an example of that. So you can actually see it wraps like uh, rings on a tree. So this would be the axon. Here's the myelin wrapping around it. And so um, one of the reasons we're interested in myelin is because uh, for about maybe seven years now, we've understood that it's highly neuroplastic. So it's a structure in the brain that changes with experience, with behavior, with learning. Um, and uh, as we've studied it more in the human brain, we've realized that not only is it neuroplastic, but it's rapidly neuroplastic. So now there's evidence that you know myelin will start changing. And this comes from animal work, but it can change in as little as like from four hours after a new exposure to something. Um, and so it's also something that we're able to image in our scanner here at UBC, and that's because um, UBC here, we do a tremendous amount of imaging work in people with have, who have multiple sclerosis, which is a disease of myelin. And so um, working with one of the collaborators on this project, Dr. Alex McKay, um, the MS group has developed this imaging approach to try to see how, what's the health of the myelin in the human brain. And what it actually does, it's very clever. So MRIs are very good at seeing water in the brain. It's actually one of the things that has a good signal they can pick up. And you see in these layers, in between each of these little myelin layers, there's a tiny, tiny bit of water trapped. And so the way we can image this is we can see in thicker myelin, there's more water trapped in those, what they're called lipid bilayers, those fatty bilayers. And in thinner myelin, there's less. And so that's the signal that we can get in the human brain. So the other reason that myelin is super interesting is because we know that it's something that is um, rapidly maturing in kids. And in fact, the myelin in your prefrontal cortex probably isn't mature until you're about 25 years of age, which explains a lot about my 20s and maybe yours as well. 
But we know that this, something's rapidly changing. It changes with experience and behavior. We, we think it's changing with learning. And it's also maturing. And so it, it's a really rich target for us to take a look at. Um, and it's also something that we can do here that's um, highly unique, that isn't, it's not widely um, available, this type of imaging around the world. So when we see higher values of myelin, we think there's probably more axons, there's greater connectivity, so that brain region is more connected. It might be an explanatory reason for the changes in the nodes that Dr. Rose is seeing, and that's represented as a thicker myelin sheath. And so if you think about your whole brain as being a network of this wiring, when you learn something, what we think is happening is some areas, the myelin gets thicker and the signal gets there faster. And in other areas, maybe you want the signal to get thinner so things get there slower or that things just get there at the right time. And so it, we have this kind of complex pattern of change in the brain with it. Okay, so um, we looked at several different uh, white matter tracks in the brain, and this is, this is highly technical, I apologize for it. But it's just to remind me to tell you that we're able to take the, the brains of the kids, we put them into a, a standard space, so they all look kind of the same, and then we can apply a very standardized map to it and extract values. So it means we can extract the same value from all your guys' brains if we image them in the exact same fashion and then look at grouping, groupings of data that way. And so we actually um, pulled out these regions specifically, and I should say that um, this work is really being led by one of my graduate students, my doctoral students, um, Ronan Denyer. And he's particularly interested in the development of math, the learning and, and processing of functions that go with math. And so he worked um, to kind of select these particular regions that we think will be important um, for different functions that these kids, the kids may change in. So we looked at an area called corpus callosum, which is connects the two sides of your brain. We know this is really important for executive uh, function for the speed of processing in math. We looked at something called the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is taking information front to back, which is again important for those same three things plus reading. We see a, a signal there in reading. Something called the cingulum, which we know is very important for higher order processing, um, executive functioning. The superior frontal occipital fasciculus, again connecting these areas, to, as you know, the frontal, frontal cortex, the occipital cortex, back front to back. Um, that's important for both executive functioning, but also for processing visual things. So if you think about reading or recognizing objects. Um, the corona radiata, which is a brain region that's taking all the information from the top of our brain, the cortex, and taking it down to lower areas. And again, important executive function processes speed, math, and reading. And then last, an area of the brain called the fornix, which is really important for working memory. So working memory is this idea that you're holding something in your memory so that you can act upon it later or in the next moment. Um, it's a very key feature of planning ahead, or what we call also forward planning. So we looked at these brain regions, and we're able to extract those that we know are specific to areas important for math. Um, and this, these actually aren't our data, but this is just showing how you line these up um, on the brain, and then you're able to see that we know that there's areas that are important for specific areas for number processing versus arithmetic versus just simple addition. So the brain's highly specialized for these different regions. Um, and we use this to seed our analyses and then extracted these regions, which I've talked about already. Okay. Um, when we do this, we see that we have, sorry, we have specific regions that come out as, as showing some relationship um, to math. And in particular, these are the corpus callosum, so these connecting regions back to forth back and forth between the two sides of your brain. Um, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is again this front to back. Um, and also, um, it also uh, is carrying information um, that, I'm sorry, let me bring it up to here. Um, I can't point to it there, that doesn't help, does it? Yes, thank you, that's a good idea. Or I can point on the screen. So the superior longitudinal fasciculus is, is here and is running information um, from the frontal areas to the posterior regions. Now, it's interesting, and I'll just highlight a few things that we've noticed about, for example, firstly, the superior longitudinal fasciculus. So the first thing to kind of notice, and maybe I'll use this so you can look at their side. If we, this is now a slide showing the relationship between the math score, the W score for math and the Woodcock-Johnson, refer all questions about that score to Rachel. And this is myelin water fraction. I can answer these questions. So in this instance, um, if I move to the side, if I move across, um, which would be to your right, 
Um, more uh, higher on the scale says that there's more myelin, and going up says we're better at math. Okay, that's just a math score. So we lump all the groups together. We put in the kids um, from the Aerosmith program and the kids who are typically developing. There's actually no relationship between myelin and math. So we then pull those groups apart. These are our, what we call our typically developing kids. They, they don't have any diagnosis of LD. And here now we see a nice strong relationship. So this is telling us that kids with more myelin are better at math in general. You have these couple kids over here who are really good at math. They don't necessarily have the most myelin, which is an interesting finding. So there may be a ceiling effect. But in general, we see this trend. This, this is the trend line going up. So more myelin, better math. Or better at math, more myelin. We don't know which direction. But I'd highlight to you then that it's really interesting to us that we don't see that same relationship in the kids um, who are now, this is at enrollment, so who are going into the Aerosmith program. And in particular, you'll see kids that we find really interesting. So if um, we look, for example, let's just pick someone out here. We look for someone who has you know, myelin of about 0.65. And you come over here. This kid, these two kids here, have the same amount of myelin as, these, as this kid. But look at the difference in their math ability. It's huge. And so there's something about the myelin in this particular area that tells us about math in the typically developing kids, but not in the LD group, not in the kids who are going into the Aerosmith program. So you know, we would interpret like a data point like this as it, it's telling us that this kid or these children, they have, like, they have the machinery that they need to be able to be you know, to perform math, but for whatever reason, they're not able to operate that machinery or to use it to their advantage. Um, so it's a very interesting finding, but it does suggest that there's potential. So you wonder about tracking a kid like this and looking at them, you know, now at the end of the year and saying, okay, they had that machinery. What happened as they practiced for a year? So that's a little bit of what we have done next. And that's saying, okay, if we looked at that baseline score and we said, well, that kid had that machinery for math, do we see them improve over time? And so here now we're looking at changes in the WJ scores as they relate to math at baseline. And what we did here actually um, with Rachel, we, we just wanted to somehow subdivide the group. And so what we did is we just said, this is the average amount of change. And now we're just going to look at kids who are above average or made more change versus kids who made less change across the year. So they just kind of split down the middle. Oops, no, I guess you can't push that. Sorry, I'm a mouse pusher. That's my normal MO. OK, now when we do that dividing and we look just at kids who make more or less change across the year, and, and that's what you see here. So in each of these plots, like this is what we call the genu or that kind of the, the bend of the corpus callosum, which is that connector between the brain regions, brain sides. We see greater responders and kids who respond it made less response. And across each of these brain regions, there's nine of them here. What we see is that the children who make the greater response are the children who entered the program with more myelin to start. So they're those kids that we, they had the machinery and they just weren't able to use it for whatever reason. So these data suggest strongly that if, we, if you're going to see the most amount of change in a, a child who comes in with already some myelin capacity, at least in these different regions, and these are the ones we've talked about, the longitudinal fasciculus, and the corpus callosum. Um, and we see, and by the way, I should back up. This isn't math. I forgot to say that. This is now looking at a working memory score from um, the testing that Rachel did. So this is now extending beyond the math and looking into other things. And the other um, test score that we saw this same pattern with was um, testing of vigilance. So we see more myelin and then these, these greater responses. And these are all significant responses statistically. Um, so it suggests to us that there may be something important about um, baseline kind of brain structure when you're starting off. That maybe there's, I don't know, some minimal criteria for being able to immediately take advantage over just the first year of the program. Um, but that's something that we've, we just don't have the data to make that kind of conclusion yet. But it does show us that um, it does matter um, what that initial structure looks like. Um, before the kids actually um, under to undergo the first year of the program. So I'm going to stop there. I'll, I'll let Rachel tell you more about the, the cognitive yeah. academic, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you go. All right. So now we're, I have a series of um, 
of results about uh, all of our behavioral measures at uh, baseline compared to um, after one year of the program. So first I'll start with the cognitive. So again, like I mentioned before, this is measured by the Wilcock-Johnson cognitive, the three. Um, and the skills assessed are very broad, just like the targets of the Aerosmith program are very broad. Um, we haven't started analyzing um, our data by specific program or specific skills that are targeted for each student. Um, we just looked at whether um, this broad swath, just like Dr. Rose talked about, um, of cognitive uh, skills, whether any of them improved in the whole Aerosmith sample. Uh, so vigilance is actually another word for attention, just in case that wasn't a term you were familiar with. So we looked at how well they learned something brand new that we taught them, how well they remembered that after a delay, uh, their processing speed, how quick, as uh, Dr. Rose already defined. Verbal flu fluency is just how quickly you can pull the words out of your vocabulary. Uh, attention or vigilance, like I said. Auditory processing, which are um, specifically your processing and speech sounds. Um, inductive reasoning or logic problem solving. Uh, and then short-term memory and working memory, which I defined earlier. So, the, I apologize for the, sl the smallness of the... Um, so the first thing we did was we actually looked across all cognitive areas and whether there were what we call multivariate effects. And we did find a significant effect overall in cognitive um, skill development over the one year for the Aerosmith program. Again, this is using those W scores that Dr. Rose mentioned earlier, <clears throat> which are more sensitive to change over time. And then uh, when we looked at specifically which skills improved, those skills were listed here. So both learning and memory. So they um, were better able to acquire new knowledge and then remember that over time. Uh, they, had, they were able to recall to pull out more of those vocabulary words um, from their, again, that's from memory. Those are words they've learned. So like, um, tell me all the animals you can think of in a minute kind of thing. Um, they were better problem solvers. Uh, they had faster decision speed, which is that, actually that uh, test that Dr. Rose didn't find anything on. We'll talk about that later. Um, and, they, and they had improved attention or vigilance. <clears throat> These small numbers up at the top, um, so you've got the sort of aqua is your baseline, and your blue bar is your post-test. Um, and the little numbers at the top, if you can see, those are our effect sizes. And several are, so our effect sizes are sort of um, small to moderate, if you're familiar with that terminology. All right, so then on to our achievement results. <clears throat> so again, this was using the Wilcock Johnson uh, Achievement Battery, the third edition. <clears throat> and we looked at skills in reading, writing, and math. We only looked at spelling and writing. And the way that Wilcock Johnson or most um, academic achievement batteries break up skills, uh, we talk about the more basic or fundamental skill. And so in, in writing, that would be spelling. And in, in reading, that's just can you uh, do you know how to read single words? And then in math, that's your actual computation ability. Then we talk about fluency, which is your speeded and automatic um, ability to use the skill. So in, in reading, that's um, how quickly can you read simple sentences. Um, in math, that's how quickly can you recall those math facts. And then we talk about the application, which is the highest level of, of the academic skill. So in reading, that's reading comprehension. Uh, and in math, that would be the word problem solving. All right, and I don't think, oh, I see she's got the separate. So this is just to show you uh, visually what, what it looks like. So um, as you can see, everything, again, aqua is baseline and the blue is the post test. So everything did improve, though some more than others. And we did see, again, a significant multivariate effect here. So across all academic measures, we saw improvement in the Aerosmith kids uh, relative to their baseline. And this is showing you the actual statistics. And so what's significant are the, um, the three that are um, colored in shades of gray. So we saw improvement in both reading and math fluency, so speeded automatic reading and math. And then we also saw improvement in computation or calculation. All right, on to some of the neuropsychological battery. Uh, I already talked about those. Oh, I do have some 
So this is just to describe the tasks that we use. So cognitive flexibility or shifting is measured by, up here we have the, the uh, dimensional change card sort, which involves um, sorting cards quickly by shape and color. And then what they do is they change the rules on them and expect them to flexibly um, respond to the stimuli. So they have to, they, they're sorting by shape and then all of a sudden they say, now short, sort by color. Um, and they see how quickly they can adjust and do that and how accurately. And the flanker <clears throat> uh, involves uh, inhibitory control and attention because they're really supposed to just pay attention to this middle arrow in the direction that it's pointing in. And they have to um, deliver by iPad. They push the, uh, um, the iPad arrow that's pointing in the right direction. Um, but uh, every so often, so they're just supposed to ignore these arrows in the directions they're pointing. And you see in this example, the arrows are actually pointing in the wrong, in the other direction. So that's the hardest um, of the trials, but sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't um, congruent. Uh, and again, that's reaction time and accuracy. And then the last, uh, I mentioned already the, the four tests that are included in our working memory battery. All right, and so we, uh, so here you have it just broken down by the constructs that are being measured, <clears throat> and you can see that uh, sort of similarly to the Toronto group, we didn't really see uh, a lot of change on the um, toolbox measures, which are these iPad um, measures of inhibition and cognitive flexibility, but what we did see change in, oops, was in spatial recall, in, uh, which is our visual measure of working memory. So the hardest uh, task involving visual working memory we did see um, improvement in, and quite, quite a large amount of growth there. And last but not least, our social and emotional resu results. So um, when you talk about the BASC two results, the BASC measures broad areas, like I said, of social, emotional, behavioral functioning, and it breaks um, those areas up by internalizing behaviors, which are um, feelings or behaviors that are directed more inward. They include things like depression and anxiety. Uh, externalizing behaviors, which are when we um, direct our behavior or our emotions outward, so typically aggression would be the best example of those. And then there are also measures of social skills and adaptive functioning. And these, like I said, were all completed by parents. So these are what parents were observing uh, at baseline and after one year. <clears throat> and <clears throat> one thing to notice is that, uh, so the, they're not aqua this time, they're a lighter blue, but every single dark blue line is um, showing improvement. Now the difference between um, <clears throat> the way that you interpret these is based on what, what it's measuring. So the top bracket right now that it's including, that's measuring positive skills, skills that we want to see in kids. So a, um, yeah, sorry, it's actually backwards. The dark blue line is baseline now and the light blue line is post-test. And that's actually showing that, that all the skills that we want to see more of improved after a year. Now they weren't all statistically significant, but the one that was, was acti activities of daily living, which includes things like they remember to brush their teeth. They can shower on their own. They, um, you know, they pack their own bag in the morning. Things we really care about as parents, right? And we'd love to see improvement in. So maybe that's a, an interesting functional outcome that's, that's pretty encouraging. <clears throat> And then these, this bottom bracket are the skills that we want, or not the skills, the behaviors that we want to see less of. So they're what we call the clinical scales. So things like attention problems, withdrawal, depression symptoms, anxiety. We hopefully want to see less of those, right? And what you see is that for every single one of those, it's heading, the data's heading in the right direction. It's, it's, it's lower. Uh, the only one that was statistically significant was attention problems. But if you remember, our data also showed that vigilance improved or attention improved. So we're seeing a... I would say this is a more um, daily evidence of some improvement in attention as opposed to the performance-based sort of not like real life task that we'd measure with attention. Um, I think, I don't know, Dr. Rose, if you want me to speak to 
why our data looks different. I, we, this is not actually a comparison to um, typically developing peers, but from a normative perspective, these are not, these are not really problematic. Our, 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 our population doesn't necessarily, their parents aren't rating them as having problems. So I would say our samples actually aren't different. It's just that we saw improvements over time. Mm -hmm. Well, it's all relative to their peer group, so yeah. So that, yeah. Mm -hmm. These are, these are norm-based scores, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I would, anyway, we can talk about it later. <laughs> it's not intended to be a measure of strength. It's intended to be a measure of, of. <laughs> all right, uh, so like I said, uh, activity to daily living and attention problems uh, were the two that were significant here. You have one more slide. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can, <laughs> you want me to present the implications here? I don't know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just, you know, what, what did we take away from at least the myelin data that, that I was able to show today? And um, I, I think I, I've already said it, but it, it does seem that, um, you know, the, the kids who kind of enter with the, the best structure are the kids who take advantage early. Now, that doesn't mean that the kids who start off with less myelin aren't capable of catching up. They just aren't catching up in one year. And so we do have, I, I think when we presented in New York, someone asked me this question. We do have data on about 12 kids now into their second year. So we, a couple of them we were able to keep a hold of and continue on. So this is really, you know, begging us to take a look at that and see what happens in, in those instances. Is it a, a time thing or some kind of fundamental limitation? And I, I just don't know because we haven't unpacked that data yet. Um, but we do feel relatively optimistic that the myelination patterns might be a biomarker, might be something we could use. Um, the problem there is, is it's not a widely available biomarker. So if you have one that you can only do on the UVC MRI. Um, it's, it's not very helpful to the world. And so what we need to do then is find ways that we could perhaps test it behaviorally and give us a good surrogate of indicator of what we might expect going forward. And so that's where, you know, we'll continue to work together, Rachel and I, to try to unpack these relationships and see how the brain and behavior might be tracking together. Uh, and then, uh, so we, we do need to be cautious with the way that we interpret um, the behavioral data because we don't have uh, a, a control group sample that includes longitudinal data. We can't actually uh, compare the growth that we did see significant in the Aerosmith group. We can't compare that to what we would see in a typical, typically developing group or what we would see in a group of kids who say are receiving special education services in a public school. So really that's the next step for us to really say what we're seeing are um, our effects of the Aerosmith program here and not just say development. Um, and also if we wanted to say that it's sort of above and beyond what you might see in, in, in any other kind of treatment as usual group. <clears throat> but we are excited by these um, results. And um, if you're familiar with the term transfer, and if not, I'll define that really quickly. So whenever we talk about intervention, cognitive intervention, we look at uh, whether the, um, the, the intervention itself improves skills that are very similar to the ones that are being worked on. So for example, the tasks, all these tasks that we gave um, in our neuropsychological and psychoeducational batteries are considered task uh, measures of near transfer. So not exactly, they're not, we didn't measure them doing the clocks task, though they do have that data. We looked at something that might be a little bit similar to the clocks task and looked at whether we, all, we saw improvement on that. <clears throat> and we did. We also saw improvement in the parent ratings of attention, say. So this could be evidence of what we call near transfer, which is very good. Um, the other exciting piece is that we may also have evidence of far transfer, which is rare in cognitive intervention research. <clears throat> we do need more evidence to, to say that definitively. Um, but FAR transfer is when you see, uh, see benefits in skills that are very different from what you've trained in, right? So doing the exercises that 
Dr. Uh, that Barbara Ayers with Young has developed um, may actually improve something that they haven't been practicing nearly as much, like math fluency or math problem solving, um, which is very encouraging as well. And like I said, pretty novel. Again, we can't say for sure this is far transfer, but it, it just may be. And I think this is particularly uh, encouraging because this is a quarter of the Aerosmith program. So the typical Aerosmith student is not just doing one year of this program. So to see these kinds of improvements after one year is very promising for our uh, future studies. I think that is our conclusion. So thank you so much um, for the three of you. I think Greg Rose is going to come up and join as well. And we're going to take questions from the audience at this point. We'll pass the, Mac, uh, the mic back and forth. Um, yes, Mark. OK, we will definitely do that. We'll pass that over. So I'm gonna, I'll hand the mic over here, and then we can just start with questions. Do you have any questions? Yeah. So the question was, what contributes to the growth of myelin? So we can all go out and do it, right? It's, it's really cool. So we, we've done a lot of work on this in my lab, and there's some really neat animal models. Um, learning is the biggest one so far. And so there's an elegant study showing. Uh, it's so clever. I wish I thought of this. But they have uh, rats running on a treadmill. And some of the rats have to learn to run a pattern. So there's, if you imagine, a, um, it's actually a running wheel. You imagine there's rungs missing from it in a, in a pattern. So they have to not put their foot there or they'll through it. And um, so this was some of the early evidence for myelin uh, and it, myelin plasticity. And it showed that the rats who just run, they stay about the same. But the rats who run and actually learn, that they show this big spike in um, Myelin, and so, and we've followed up on that work in my lab and shown in young, healthy people and in individuals with stroke. And now, we think we have these relationships in children as well. That um, acquisition of a of a novel skill or a novel fact. Um, uh, so any type of learning seems to facilitate the development of myelin. And then, of course, development is the other thing. So we do see that myelin is developing and becoming more elaborated in the prefrontal cortex up to about age 25 is when it seems to finally achieve maturity and become stable. So that's the other piece. Um, but some other evidence for myelin is that the number one thing that is the best predictor of how much myelin you have in your brain is the years of education. Years of education. It makes me feel good about being in school till I was 36. So that, see, this kills me because I'm a big exerciser. It actually was the learning, not the exercise. At least in rats. Now, we're not rats, so exercise is still good. Go do it. But in the rats, what seemed to be important was the, um, the actual learning of the sequence itself. And then you can do neater or different kinds of experiments in rats than you can in humans. And so they're able actually to stain the myelin and look at what was new um, versus what was just an elaboration of what was there. And in the learning, they actually see these, these new it's a, a myelin is made by oligodendrocytes in the brain. So you see new oligodendrocytes being produced to support the learned behavior. We, we actually haven't done those analyses yet, um, partly because we need a bigger sample, to be honest. It requires. The, your stats to really look at age start to require more numbers. Have you tried the mine? How does it look? Mm -hmm. mine, yeah. So again, um, we have played a little bit in the healthy controls with just looking at um, the relationship between age and myelination. Uh, and I, in a different talk, I have these myelination development curves that we've generated, um, and and you do see elaboration of of so more myelin with more age. However, the, the, uh, the, the brain region that, um, 
the brain region that's really slow is the prefrontal and then other brain regions are already fairly mature even in like the 10, 12, 14 year old. So it really, really depends on where we're looking. So we talk about any of the executive functions, the prefrontal cortex, age is really mattering. But when we talk about some of the other things like posterior parietal lobe and the, the area that, for example, is relating to vigilance, not as important. They seem to be more mature or maturing at an earlier rate. So the question is, if myelin is, is it made from fat, does diet affect it? Um, I, I don't know of studies that directly relate diet and myelination, but certainly um, fat, so lipids, are, are very important in the human brain. Um, and uh, for any type of neuronal function, you do need to have some certain degree of this, these fatty um, lipid substances that insulate them. So I know that there's animal model work looking at myelination and diet types of things, but it's not, it's not out just yet. So I'm, at least to my knowledge, I'm not sure. So, but fat is good. You can go home and eat cheese, drink wine. We looked at that. So the question is, do we see global changes, just more myelin pre and post? And we do, but we're not sure if it's a development and aging effect or if it's an effect of the intervention. And so actually a kind of a, a I guess a, a plea or just a comment is one of the things that we're working on now here at UBC is to try really hard to bulk up our control group so that we can really start to understand and say, okay, that's just development, that's intervention, and pull it apart. And so if you have children without braces between the ages of nine and 17, <laughs> We'd love to put them in our brand new MRI, which just is opening, and, um, and then do that again in nine months. <laughs> um, but we, that is a goal for the year ahead so that we can really unpack questions like that. Yeah, so the question is, what's the long-term plan, and could we bring kids back in five or 10 years to understand kind of how they've translated these changes into their, their lives, really? Um, we don't have a specific plan at the moment, um, not because we wouldn't like to ask that question, but because we don't have funding to pursue it at, at this time. We do have a researcher meeting tomorrow morning, though, where we're trying to lay out an agenda of key questions and things that we could do regardless of if you're here or in Carbondale or we have researchers in Europe as well who are quite interested. And so we're, we're trying to kind of identify how we could follow kids forward. And this is just me, and I haven't even said this out loud to my colleagues yet, um, so preview of coming attractions. When I think about these things, I always think about, okay, what's like the, like, like, what's like the Chevy model of research? Like it would be cheap and we could get it done, and then what's our you know, Bentley model if we could, you know, convince Mark Zuckerberg this is a good idea and he could sling some of that money this way. And so that would be the idea would be to think, okay, we could definitely click this. It wouldn't cost much. This would cost a little. And then if we get really lucky, we could bring them all back in five and 10 years. Um, so I don't know. That's at least the way I am envisioning it. But uh, Greg and Rachel may have better ideas. Well, you know, I mean, again, it's sort of like, well, what, what are the odds of being able to hang on to the subject group long enough to, uh, you know, to take a look at whatever measures we decide. And I think that that, at least to my mind, is an ultimate goal. I mean, what I am most interested in, though, at this point is deciding, you know, how can we get the most for the least? So for me, and Rachel and I are going to have good conversations, I think, about the relative merits of the Woodcock-Johnson achievement test versus, for example, report cards or, you know, like what kinds of jobs do these kids end up having? You know, something that actually is monitored quite carefully at the Brem School. So, you know, these are things that don't necessarily cost a lot of money. They cost bird dogging, you know, having a, a person who stays in touch with the students that we've assessed initially. And, you know, I think, yeah, we're all right now just trying to figure out if we hadn't seen any changes in anything, there really wouldn't be a need to go further. 
But now we're seeing these changes and we have our different ideas about, well, what's more important and what's less important? What do we think is, you know, is really pivotal and what's going to predict responsivity and stuff? Well, you know, now is our, our, our is the time.